Someone by the name of John Gates asked me in just a quick comment in my previous video, why do you meditate? <laughs> uh, how do you answer that? If, you, if you're a meditator, how do you normally answer that question when people ask you? If you bother to tell people, I can I can imagine some people who meditate just don't bother telling anybody else because you're gonna they're gonna say oh isn't that interesting tell me more oh boy try and explain your experiences try and explain your inner life to somebody and watch the head start to shake well I think I've attempted to deal with this before um, but here's my reasoning or here's my motivation or whatever term you want to call the impetus I guess behind me crouching down and meditating I live in an age in which we're we seem to have two states um, and I don't mean an age as in my age I mean the particular era that I live in we're either overstimulated or we're understimulated both um, both are potentially toxic um, because you're overstimulated, you have stress or addictions or something like that. Uh, if you're understimulated, uh, you have boredom, which to me is one of the most toxic conditions that there can be is boredom. I think uh, boredom is something that's wildly underestimated in its destructive power in our present age, I guess. Um, <clears throat> So we're either overstimulated or we're understimulated, and there's no shortage of things out there to stimulate us. So what I find meditation does is it allows me to control the rate at which inputs come in, and it, or, or I would assume that it would allow me to at least regulate um, the information that I'm getting from the outside world and my processing of that information. Because if, you if you've spoken to somebody with anxiety, uh, or if you've ever been in a state of acute anxiety, it's just a zillion things all happening at once. There's a certain degree of over overstimulation in your mind that's taking place. You want to calm that down. That's why some people, I guess, um, get drunk or you know um, do whatever, uh, engage in sports, um, that kind of thing, calming the mind. That's good. It's also important, actually, though, once you've calmed the mind, to get it used to the fact that you've sort of tightened the valve a bit on the stimulation from the outside. So, you know, an obvious pratfall with attempting to meditate is what do you do when boredom strikes? Again, boredom is a killer, if you ask me. Boredom is a way that saps your vitality uh, in, in a or it's a thing that saps your vitality in a way that you don't grasp and a lot of people sort of say that oh this is so boring or you know I'm so bored or whatever um, that's an understandable thing to say but what do you do about that do you go out and you stimulate yourself or do you control the way at which the outside world is, is stimulating you if you were to take somebody, say, from a farm in, I don't know, medieval Bulgaria, and teleport him into this boring room, now, he would probably be massively overstimulated, because he would see so many things that he can't understand, and it would probably frighten him. He'd be overstimulated. You plunk me in here, and I look around, and I've already read all the books on the shelves, and, you know, it's just a laundry room, and stuff like that just you know okay I I if I relied upon stimulation in this room I'd be pretty disappointed same room two different levels of stimulation depending on what's already in here what's already uh, what, what already constitutes stimulation and overstimulation and understimulation the world just is what we make of it is I won't say it's up to us, but it does seem to be uh, at least somewhat controllable. Um, we have experiences. Uh, we have experiences of things that are unique only to ourselves. Like I say, my experience of this room sitting in here by myself would be radically different from <laughs> a peasant from medieval Bulgaria sitting in the same room. Um, 
what we can control is what's going on in here. And what meditation does, I find, is it doesn't so much as clear your mind of anything, but it clarifies the contents of your mind. It allows you to put everything in its proper place, as it were. Um, you know, the obvious advantage to that, I suppose, is the next time you're going into an extremely stressful situation, you've already thought it through and you've managed to clear your mind of all the things that might distract you during that period of stress or whatever. The benefits, the enhancements that you get from meditation, how it actually makes your life better as opposed to allowing you to deal with negatives like over and under stimulation, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to talk about the benefits. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what's the positive stuff? Well, what does it feel like when you reach a state of mental clarity that is unbelievably pleasant? It's not just an absence of something. There's a positive thing. Um, how would you describe that to somebody else? See, that's the tricky thing about positives, I find, in human existence. A lot of the positives, at least after a certain point, perhaps most of them or all of them, have to be sought. You have to find out what turns your crank. You may not even understand why it's turning your crank, but you got to find out what that is. There's only one place you can look for it, in here. That's it. Um, because you know, I could explain to somebody for 30 years, sit there and explain to them what I find so uh, wonderful or whatever, interesting or useful or whatever you want to call it, in Tantra. Um, but 99.99999% of the human race would simply go, oh my god, this guy's into some really screwed up weird stuff and I, I haven't got a clue, he's out to lunch, he's, you know, all this kind of thing. So, you know, it, it kind of... It's very, very, very difficult to describe the benefits that you get. And I don't mean just the obvious benefits, i.e. greater mental clarity or everything. I mean the actual, like, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <sighs> Good luck with that one. That, I find, one must intuit oneself towards. And uh, it's an, an, intuit, an intuition, I guess that isn't emotional the way that we normally refer to the intuitive. It's not, you're not sort of emoting yourself towards, I don't know, some wonderful feeling of being at one with the universe or something like this, just, although there is that, and like some people, I mentioned bhakti before, a lot of people that chant mantra meditation to a god are actually playing with their emotions deliberately to bring out this enormous feeling of love that is apparently lying latent inside of every human being. Um, but when I talk about intuiting your way inside your own mind towards the positive, but you're not really going after it emotionally, how, how, how do you describe that? <laughs> um, how Have you ever read Dante's Paradiso, where he goes to heaven? It doesn't look very heavenly, does it? It just, you know, angels playing harps and all these saints up there. Okay, it all seems rather dull, if you ask me. Well, what would make it a good place? How would you describe? It's a state. It is a state that one arrives at. Um, it, it matters not a jot to me if I'm simply somehow manipulating my nervous system in such a way as to bring on the good stuff, the good feelings that my body is perfectly capable of producing. Good mental feelings, good psychological feelings, good emotional feelings, whatever. Um, why would I not do that? But the thing is, how do I describe how I get there through meditation? Oh, <laughs> how do you describe anything about when you're meditating? Um, that's why I think uh, this is this is why I think tantra has so many crazy diagrams of everything. Is they're trying to draw something that can't be drawn. <laughs> they're trying to deal with concretely with a subject that cannot be concretely dealt with. Um, you know, in many ways I find that an extremely bold, brave thing to do because it seems to be almost foredoomed to failure. 
Um, which is why I'm sort of so averse to actually getting into it too much because you end up going off all maps. A lot of people think I've made so many videos on this subject that I've really uh, dealt with it exhaustively. I haven't even begun. <laughs> I haven't, you know, uh, I haven't even begun to dis to describe what's going on in here, and you can't. It's it's my inner life. It has to be lived. It has to be experienced. Um, you know, it's uh, how do you how do you like how would you explain to somebody? Uh, an ecstatic feeling of great pleasure, great joy, great knowledge, and everything shooting up the back of your spine. That's supposedly the Kundalini experience. Uh, I'm not really even going after that in my lifetime. I couldn't be bothered with really getting heavily into this as a way of life. Um, but how, how do you describe that? How do you ex how do you describe existential joy to somebody? How do you describe a profoundly positive feeling? I find it a lot easier to, to discuss this or talk about this with women, believe it or not. Um, although, I suppose it's pretty obvious when you think about it why. Because women, culturally or otherwise, have a vocabulary by which they can deal with their feelings. You know, you hint at everything. You, you're elliptical. You, um, you just sort of feel your, your way towards what you're trying to talk about. You know, that's why a lot of men say when when my wife starts to talk about something important, I completely lose the plot because she's all over the place. She's trying to discuss something with you that is impossible to talk about or very difficult to talk about. Uh, that's my sexist sort of uh, angle to this. So why does anybody meditate? <laughs> I, I would challenge any meditator to answer that question and with any degree of confidence, essentially. <laughs> without feeling, oh my god, this is going to sound really stupid. <laughs> um, which is, again, why I don't want to ever think that I'm trying to talk anybody into doing what I do. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no. Uh, and I fully expect uh, to be deluged by ridicule every time I bring it up. I'm surprised that people actually <laughs> have been so uh, forbearing with uh, this admittedly crazy subject matter that I'm dealing with. Um, I know it's eccentric. I know that nobody else is going to understand, or <laughs> I, I accept the fact that nobody else may understand. A few people might get it. Um, but, you know, that that really isn't important to me. Uh, the important fact is, I know why I'm doing it. And whether or not that means something to someone else is neither for me to know or uh, for me to comment on. And ultimately, it's none of my business. Ultimately, I think I can't know these things. So, you know, how do you explain good feelings as opposed to an absence of negative? How do you explain that? You can't. It's, it's something you have to experience. Such experiences I have had, and if people want to tell me I didn't have that experience, I would like to say, okay, why don't you prove that I didn't? <laughs> you know, um, because that's essentially what you know, the sort of hard materialistic view of this kind of thing is. What you're doing is just this, that, or the other. It can all be explained. Yeah, it can all be explained externally, but how about the experience? How about the, the actual qualia involved in actually doing this? And qualia have effects on you. Experiences mold you. Your experiences are ultimately all that you are. Experience are, is nature and nurture. So, if you can control your experiences or manipulate your experiences or manipulate the way at which, or regulate the way at which the outside world affects you on the inside, I think that that's a, something that's worth pursuing. If, um, you know, if you want me to explain how I can actually do that, got 30 years? <laughs> I don't, I'm afraid. 